Jonathan Sherman is a litigator for the law firm of Boy Schiller and Flexner and a longtime leading advocate for cameras in the court. And he's kind enough to join us now. And, and Jonathan, um, many people may have seen your op-ed piece you wrote in the Times to end the Supreme Court's ban on cameras. You know, when I talk with my audience and my legal panel about um, the case before the high court right now, I have to read quotes from the justices and try to divine uh, the inflection or anything else. I've heard a lot of arguments, including from justices, that if you brought cameras into the highest court, you compromise the only non-political institution that there is in the country, and we do it at our own peril. Why are they wrong? Uh, well, it's not a non-political institution to begin with. No court is. And uh, I don't think any justice uh, would disagree with that. Every judge is subject to pressures. Every judge reads the paper. It's the first thing every law student learns in law school. But there's certainly truth to the argument that if you bring individuals, uh, cameras, uh, and therefore a hidden audience into a courtroom, you change the dynamic. But you do that when you open a courtroom to a jury. You do that when you open a courtroom to individuals such as the 500 uh, who watched the argument uh, yesterday. You always change the dynamic of the act of justice when you bring individuals of the public in to watch what happens. In our system, both our jury system and more broadly speaking, our civil, civil monitoring system, the First Amendment, we tend to presume that the public gets to see unless there is an overriding purpose, an overriding and clear and imminent danger that the function of the government can't be done. So, for example, in the case of the Supreme Court, if you have audio tapes that everyone can listen to by pressing a button, on the New York Times website. Why can't you have videotapes? If Justice Scalia, as he did yesterday, can make a joke about uh, the 14th Amendment's due process clause and then turn to the Fourth Amendment, or uh, maybe it's the Sixth Amendment, the amendment that is about full faith and credit, and say, finally, the provision that deals with the text of the Constitution to laughter, why do we think that he's incapable of discharging his responsibility as one of the smartest, best, most important jurists in the country if you have a camera trained on him so that I can see and you can see. You've seen um, a lot of the comments. In fact, you referenced it in uh, your op-ed piece that Kennedy says, hey, people are going to be mugging for the cameras here, and you're going to have justices that are going to try to inevitably get their soundbite out there or even ask a question to, to go for effect. I mean, if people want to relate it to probably the most viewed trial in recent memory, the OJ trial, you know, many people argued that uh, Judge Ito and others, um, uh, you know, they were playing for second careers in certain cases, <laughs> that, it, that it perverted the process. Why is that completely wrong? Uh, I don't know that it's completely wrong. And I don't know that it is, it was wrong. I don't know that it was wrong in the OJ case. Um, I do think that high profile trials are part of our political culture. They always have been. And um, being seen by the public is part of the process of subjecting yourself to the government system. So, the, the mugging for the cameras and the fear that justice won't be done are general propositions that don't stand up to scrutiny when you take a look at the experience of cameras in all of the states, except New York, or most of the states, uh, trial courts, except New York, or even in the OJ case. What, for example, Rich, is the central feature of the O.J. case that we remember. We remember O.J. Simpson mugging, as it were, for the cameras with that gloves, and Johnny Cochran saying, if it doesn't fit, please acquit. That was for a jury. The jury didn't see the camera. The, jury, the camera was behind the jury box, way above here. The jury held Simpson's fate in his hands. Simpson's use of the glove as a visual wasn't mugging for the cameras. He was trying to get free. 
Edo was incapable, I think we all agree, of handling a high-profile trial. Why is the public punished for things that happen in the courtroom because the nature of the case is high profile? And don't get me wrong, punishment it is. The last part, the last component, the last memory of the O.J. Simpson trial that we have is of the verdict. And that split screen, which mm -hmm. is a very powerful image, right? Well, every white person in America who believed that it was jury nullification only believed so because they had images of the trial, like the glove acquittal. No one, I think, would contest the argument that some people in the OJ case tried to get second careers. But these are lawyers, they're professionals, and they wanted uh, on each side to win. That's what lawyers in court do, as you know, Rich. So I have a great problem with the proposition that the fundamental flaw of the OJ case and that the OJ case should be, that flaw should be applied to every single case in, in American history when everyone uses cameras. I am right now staring at a camera in my office in Washington, D.C. And when this is over and you put it up on your website, this interview is over, you will have an iPhone and you will be on the subway or you will be driving with someone hopefully driving you on uh, the Merritt Parkway. And you may want to look at what happened on your show tonight. And you'll read the text that your producers have written and you'll click on the excerpt on the same iPhone of this interview. The, inf the combination of written and visual image in today's society, the use of, of, uh, of imagery is not, a, it's cameras in the courts. It's a kind of a misnomer. Um, Nancy Gertner, a judge in Massachusetts, federal judge, former federal judge, very much in favor of cameras, now a professor at Harvard Law School, wrote an article recently about how this is not a camera in the court question. This is about how the internet generation, all of us, live using this kind of technology and exchanging these kind of views through a combination of written, audiovisual, and a combined audiovisual use of words. So, uh, uh, sound bites. How do we know what the justices think about cameras? Well, Justice Scalia, sound bite. Well, let's, let's bring it full circle, Jonathan. I'm curious. Have you had this conversation with a partner of your firm, David Boyce, who probably was involved in the most political of cases, obviously Bush v. Gore? Mm -hmm. and, and does he believe that if there were the sunlight, if the cameras were in there, and the American public basically got to hear the arguments and the rationales and the questions from the court in effect deciding a presidency that we would have more or less confidence um, in the court and how they reached that decision or not. I've actually never talked to David about the confidence question. I have talked to him many times uh, about the question of cameras. He's a very strong believer in cameras. He's a strong believer, I think, generally in, in information and in the proposition that Justice Holmes and Brandeis believed in that we're on our own in democracy. We govern ourselves. When the printing press was invented, uh, the Catholic Church was scared for about 160 years. And it got used to it. And it's still the Catholic Church. When um, new technologies are invented like the film, like movies, uh, people's careers change. Technology changes the way we live our lives in a long, you know, 30,000 year history. There is, I think, a general agreement, by, at least in, in conversations I've had with David, that there's no question that the presumption ought to be in favor of cameras. You don't need double blind studies. You don't need endless experimentation. Uh, Rich, not a single verdict in um, 50 years has been reversed because of the adverse effect of pretrial publicity that involved a televised trial. I'm not sure there are that many cases that are reversed, uh, you know, verdicts that are reversed because of pretrial publicity. But I do know that you and the news media have a right to say anything you want about any trial you want, any way you want to. You can be like John Oliver on his show on HBO. The best argument for cameras in the court was a skit he did about two months, three months ago, 
using the audio recordings of the Supreme Court, literally the same kinds of recordings we heard today, and dogs, live action dogs, beagles, dachshunds, dressed up in robes with a dog lawyer standing, standing there and kind of motion capture video of their mouths moving to the audio. We had everything that we needed except the actual justices. Um, one, one additional point on, on this score about sunlight. Uh, Jeff Tubin wrote a wonderful piece in the New Yorker about a year, year and a half ago about this question. And he called, it was about actually about Justice Thomas and his silence. He has not asked a question. I don't know whether he did yesterday. I don't think so. He has not asked a question on the court for about 13 years. And he's only asked, I think, one or two before that. When you're listening to a tape, when you're listening to an audio tape, you can't know that. You don't, you don't really know whether he's asked a question. But a bank of nine black robes in front of you, uh, an image of Justice Kennedy anguishing over whether or not to side with same-sex marriage or with religious freedom, if that's what you want to describe it as. And Justice Thomas quietly, over the years, saying nothing. That's information. It may not mean much. No, but Jonathan, that brought me to what was going to be my last question with the optics. And, and you touched on part of it, which was, we haven't heard anything um, from, uh, from Justice Thomas. And in some ways, that becomes more apparent when there's obviously the red light on the camera on. But if every attorney I've had here who's ever before, appeared before the high court said, you get about 30 seconds to do your opening statement, they'll cut you right <laughs> off. And, right. and more than that, that you get a visceral, honest exchange of ideas because they're just trying to get to it. Do we risk compromising at all where if somebody's going to go really hard at you uh, just to try and find the lines, let's say, for gay marriage, even if they agree with the premise, that they might hesitate on that because now there's a camera, and as we do in the media and you pull only a little bit of it, they'll be coming off as a homophobe, uh, just to draw an example. Or if somebody on the issue of, uh, of health care would come in there and they want to ask a question about where do I draw a line as to, you know, should I have to pay for this cancer treatment or not, they'll come across as this callous, unfeeling person. Does it change where they can go now because now all of a sudden we have pictures that go with the story? It's a very good question, possibly. But, um, but the same is true of audio. The same is true of having Adam Lipchak and Jan Crawford and you in the courtroom summarizing what is said. Um, the, the marginal informational benefit, the incremental benefit of visual information, I think is, is great. The cost of having it, I think, is purely hypothetical, at least in a material sense. The people who argue in the Supreme Court are either there for the only time in their lives, and it's a career highlight, or they are, it's like you doing, if you decided to do, if you got one night to do the, you know, whatever the best international news show was, right? And that's all you wanted in your career. And you had that night. Would you have trouble? Would you not do the news well? For lawyers in the Supreme Court, it's the same thing. And the justices, these are people who are heard orally, A-U-R-A-L, every time they have an oral argument. And they are people who explain themselves only through these opinions that they write. And I have a great difficulty believing that there would be a change on either of those. But I also have great difficulty believing it matters. If someone is in the Supreme Court and he is going to argue or she is going to argue um, a point and is swayed by the fact that the public happens to be interested in watching and tells you something about the advocate and maybe about the social stigma that should go with a particular point of view. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the public. I'm not suggesting, and no one who advocates cameras responsibly suggests that cameras should be allowed in court where the public is not allowed in court. In fact, I argue often to the consternation of many media lawyers that there are cases where the public should be allowed in where the cameras shouldn't, like undercover police officers or testimony of a child uh, who is um, uh, the victim of a sexual assault. But 
a case like the one yesterday, a case like the health care case you were describing in the Supreme Court without witnesses, where the record is distilled to the essential questions, and the questions that the justices are asking each other are as much for the benefit of each other as they are for the uh, information they elicit from the lawyers. I, I can't, I can't imagine why we would think mm. that it should be. It would be more political uh, than otherwise. It's like saying, Rich, it, 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 people bring a kind of a mythological image to the Supreme Court as though they really are these old wise and masters who really know more. And they, especially the conservatives, for years, they have pushed hard against that idea. So why are they opposed to the notion that they should be seen like everybody else? If you read Dostoevsky, you will learn a lot about how the majesty and the mystery and the terror of a person on a bench in Crime and Punishment or in some of his other writings um, tells you a great deal about how humans are incapable of piercing through power. We don't know why this court asked the questions that it asked yesterday. And we can't tell whether Adam, it's Adam Liptak, my old colleague, or anyone else, what they're gonna do. They surprise us all the time, as Justice Roberts did in the Affordable Care Act. But I really would have loved to have seen Justice Roberts at the Obamacare argument earlier this year, the second Obamacare argument about the statute that permits these exchanges to be set up by the federal government when states decline to do so. Because Justice Roberts saved Obamacare and everybody in the world, in, the Amer in America, has a view on it. I, I would have loved to have seen the information on his face that he showed when he came into the court, when he sat down, when he started asking the first question, when he was waiting, juries in our system, Rich, who rely on juries to assess the credibility of individuals. We often make fun of juries as not understanding the complexity of what goes on. And yet, judges are the biggest advocates of the jury system, most trial judges. And if you've ever been in a courtroom or been in a trial, you know why. Because there's something about credibility. There's something about the visual that helps you assess credibility, even if you don't know what the hell you're talking about. So whether or not seeing Justice Kennedy yesterday or seeing Justice Roberts in the second Obamacare case, King v. Burwell, tells us information we need as the sovereign. We are the sovereign. Citizens are the sovereign under this court's jurisdiction. It doesn't strike me that the presumption ought to lie against as much information as possible. It ought to be the other way around because they're the ones who have the power and we're the ones who are supposed to be empowered. Hey, uh, Jonathan, um, end of the day, you think in our lifetime we see cameras in the uh, Supreme Court? Yes, and I have ideas. <laughs> yes, I do. Hey, great stuff. Um, I happen to agree with you. I'm going to see what the panel's got to say. Jonathan Sherman, thank you so much for a few minutes. I really appreciate it. Not at all, Rich. Thank you.